Hello, I'm back playing Road Warden again after so long. It's been many, many months since I actually recorded. Time just goes by so fast. I don't know if you have like health problems and like doctor's appointments and then other things you're trying to settle and then other your own your own games, your own projects and stuff. It's like time can slip by so then all of a sudden you're like oh my god it's halfway through the new year and I, I, I don't even know what happened anyway apparently it's been october since i played right now it's currently july 2023 <laughs> so hopefully i remember i probably I, I think i've forgotten the voices that i did for any of these people through and what i've already done so i'm, I'm just gonna check out my stuff for a second i'll cut most of it out because uh, somebody who's watching this in order already knows I just don't know also if I do anything stupid or seem uninformed it's because uh, I don't know if I can hold this information in my brain for eight months what's still gonna be there day eight. no sooner than day 10 or no later than day 10 I just read it no sooner than on day 10 but I should leave with them as early as I can someday before afternoon while the bird is still around. Travel to Gale Rocks look for a fisher maybe if we got to Gale Rocks I could get the fish take it back to the guy and then make my way back up here and then do the bird hunting but i don't know it, yeah, and i was thinking somehow the scavenger might be connected with the other guy that i'm looking for the main things that are timed it's said to get back here in like two days to do bird stuff and then also at some point i need to do that fish thing but really most of what i need to do is just keep moving I just need to keep going this way and see what I find. Also, I should come back here at some point and figure some of this stuff out down here, but I can't remember a voice from eight months ago. Wasn't he the one that was kind of like this or something? Is, is that him or is that the other person? Two kids and one of them kind of had a voice like this or something. And the other one kind of sounded like this and like all shrimpy and mean. But I don't remember which one this is. So Ilan is the tall guy who kind of talks like this. The man in the black fur is short. His name is Fee and he talks like this and then the one hand man is like this old guy let's actually do something now that i've now that i've refreshed eight months of information in five minutes okay i said fine i'll be back in two days or soon after that and in grins do so we still need to prepare and you better do so as well but don't make us wait for long let's not test the bird's patience just come one day before afternoon i turn toward the one without a hand do you know tulia the man gives you a surprised glance, but then looks down and crosses his arms, holding his hand under his shoulder. I'm a new man now. There's nothing that ties me to the army. You've crossed a great part of this land, greater than most. Have you seen anything unusual? He takes a deep breath, his voice is close to a whisper. There's fog in my soul. I was on the eastern road, hungry and sick, praying for the right to send its beast on me, save me from the pains of living. I remember the touch of fur and the breath on my neck, the claws pinning me to the ground. I was waiting with my eyes closed, then I woke up in the middle of the night, still feeling. I got back on my feet, walking until I reached the lights of this tavern, without so much as a bruise. Foggy may have no faith in her heart, but the right used her kindness to give me a second chance. Ilan frowns at the man's words, and there's cautiousness in his voice. He may be crazy, but it's true. He came here after midnight, raving. Maybe the monsters don't like his scent. So, you forgot everything? He hides his stump in the palm of his hand and curls up. I've seen a dragon eating a tree, an ape that tore away the head of a monstrous cat, and a wolf without fur that was quick as a lightning. Now leave me alone, evil spirit. Let my shame rest. He's shaking. Let him be, all right? Speed grunts at you. Nothing wrong about a man trying to forget. Ilan rubs his chin. A furless wolf, friend? I've heard about one. Our tribes folk saw it in the heart of the woods. A nasty beast. Let's hope it won't find a mate for breeding. It charges at you like a runner, then jumps right at your throat. He touches his neck. So even the hunters stay away from him. Too bad we've no crossbows. He raises his wooden club. Ah, better to avoid the deep woods without one. Caius, I guess, is the guy without an arm. Seems to be too on edge to speak anymore. You often have travelers here. Also, if I already asked some of these, sorry, I, I don't remember. It was eight months ago. <laughs> <laughs> you often have travelers here. Ilan's voice is like thunder. No, 
You may very well be the last one this season. Sometimes a group of adventurers, who knows why, and southern traders in spring and autumn. Most of our visitors are from the villages, usually creeks and gale rocks. They leave goods at our place or just outside, and Ma barters in their name with the others. I mean, rocks, timber, burrs, and barreled fish can wait a few days. What can you tell me about the peninsula? Svi lets out a sigh. Well, not much to see here, hmm? Trees, rocks, ponds. I've never been in Howlers. He starts, but then Ilan chirps in. I have, a couple of times. Nice place, kind folks, lots of grain. They have but one trader, a Kakios. He pays poorly, but at least doesn't waste one's time. Get straight to the point, hmm? He thinks for a bit. And they're all so tall! Twice as tall as he is! He points at Svi, who frowns and squeaks back at him. Bullshit! You gossip for the next few minutes, but the things they share with you are of little use. They end up saying that you should talk with Foggy instead. She used to travel a lot and speaks with every visitor, apparently. Alright, well I already did that because I went in and talked to her and I talked to these guys afterwards. So that means all I have to do is go somewhere else, I guess. I'm done here. I walk away! You're in the middle of the yard. Scambled egg. Scambled egg? <laughs> Scambled egg is observing the movement on the lake. I already did that. I don't want to wash myself in the lake. That could be scary. Uh, let's travel. I'm just going to keep going this way. I wonder if I can complete this circle. The road east is beaten and clean, with enough space to fit two wagons side by side. You pass by a few plum trees, apple trees, and cherry trees, but many more stumps, likely belonging to what has been turned into Foggy Lake. The life in the plains is busy and loud, but so far you don't see any lurking beasts. Judging by the many trampled parts of the meadows and the fresh food trails, the foragers search this corner of the peninsula quite often. They didn't leave much behind. You reach a shining pond at the edge of the forest. You ride beneath two trim trees growing on the opposite sides of the path, like columns leading to Wright's temple. Shouts and heavy steps prepare you for trouble ahead. Two shells are circling around each other. One of them is a four-legged saurian with dark grey skin, as long as your palfrey but only knee-high. It's wandering left and right along the bank, hissing, repetitively sticking its split tongue out and then retracting it. The stout monster doesn't look like a born hunter of humans, but its long tail is swinging like a whip. For now, only threateningly so, but you don't doubt that getting hit by it would likely break your bones. The second one belongs to a brown-skinned man wearing leather pants, a long brown wooden cloak, and a matching pelt of a wolf on his head and shoulders, like a haunting hood. His voice is both gentle and scared, and he's stretching his hands in front of him, trying to make the beast stay away as if it's a mouflon. The third shell is right in the middle between the other two, a creature you don't recognize from a distance, but it is in a puddle of its own blood and it isn't moving. Well, maybe the, 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 whatever the hell, Saurian. Saurian, like, attacked this other little thing, and the guy's trying to calm it down and be like, Hey, you killed my puppy! <laughs> well, what do you think I'm gonna do? Of course I'm gonna ride slowly, taking a closer look at the entire situation. I don't understand jumping into a situation before you know all the facts. I know sometimes you have to do that. Like, survival scenarios and stuff, you have to just act, but I- <laughs> That's why I wouldn't be good at it. Because I'd be like, wait, I need to analyze, I need to understand, can I get more information first? Ew. So I'm kind of a mix. I am a pretty blunt and decisive person when it comes to some things. Like, I, it's very quick for me to look at something and go, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. I like this, I don't like that, I like that, I don't like that. Like, I, I know myself very well and I have strong opinions, but also, in a situation that I don't know anything about, I need to gather information for 97 years <laughs> before I finally decide exactly what I should do. I think it's like, if it's something that I've thought about before, I've come to my conclusions and I understand and I can make a quick decision, but if it's something I've never thought about before or is a new situation, it's like, whoa, hold on, <laughs> let me do research. I ride slowly, taking a closer look at the entire situation. You stand up in the saddle to have a better view and realize that the corpse on the ground is but that of a white ebex. The man who acknowledges your presence with a nod speaks with a hint of playfulness in his voice, asking the Saurian to be so nice as to stay away. He then turns to you and points at the prey. Friend, lend me a hand, will you? I'm trying to seize it. As you dismount, the Saurian takes a step closer to the pond. Erm, trying to seize what? Does that mean he's trying to get the corpse? and take it somewhere, or he's trying to seize the Saurian. Just step away, I'm not gonna help you die for a scrap of meat. I don't think your Ebex can be helped, kind stranger. 
He tilts his head and lets out a chuckle. No, <laughs> no, not mine was the kill, and I'm not a beast breeder. He pointed his hat, as if it's meant to be proof of some sort. The brown mouth resting on his forehead is quite distracting. But there's food in the middle of the road. How can I look away? This Ebex is our destiny, friend. After a short pause, he whispers, Say, do you have any fruit in those sacks? Throw some at it. He points at the beast. Why would it care about fruit? It has a whole Ebex to eat. Oh, just trust me. It only hunts when there's nothing better for it to pick. They live on trees, you know. You look at the Saurian shell, wet from water in which it was sitting in not so long ago. The man notices your gaze. I'm almost sure. So is that like a hint that like... <laughs> The Saurians actually live in water, they definitely don't live on trees, and he's completely wrong, and I'm just gonna waste my fruit for nothing. What does my journal say about it? The vast range of four-legged creatures that resemble dragons. They attack humans. They prefer eating animals. So I don't think... I think you're wrong, Mr. Man. It isn't worth the risk, but also I'm curious, you know? <laughs> I kind of want to see if, like, maybe I'll get a reward from him, or, you know, I could make some- he could have some information for me or something. I'm not gonna give them fruits, though. I think- I think this is a hint that the fruits are not gonna work. I'm just gonna waste my- waste my carefully collected vegetables for nothing. I sigh and look at my weapon. I'll distract it. You grab the ebex and drag it away. He scratches his hood and nods with approval. You know what, friend? That's an excellent plan. Do so. Without another glance, he once again shouts at the beast, then dashes away from you, followed by his cape. The monster hisses and reaches forward, as if waiting to see what you're going to do. You step forward, hoping to draw the monster's attention as far away from the carcass as possible. It answers your challenge and shortens the distance even further. So, like, I'm not gonna attack at first, but I'm just gonna focus on avoiding it if it attacks me. I don't know if this would work, though. I focus on avoiding its attacks. How do you expect it to strike? Uh... Probably with its bloody tail. I keep an eye on its tail. The Saurian still surprises you with the range of its attacks. It turns round while pouncing forward and swings the tail at your chest. Thanks to all the attention you paid to its movement, you duck beneath it and jump away. The next few sways are distant enough that you don't have to fear them. Ha! Dumb beast! You hear. The thief is running away with the ebex on his back, holding it by the legs while it hangs from his shoulders. You chase after him, barely able to outspeed the monster yourself as it's already lost any interest in you. Without your help with the weight of the carcass, you doubt the man could get far. I shout at Scambled Egg to run. You follow the trail of blood as well as the constantly bouncing head of a brown wolf. Once you get close, the man doesn't mind sharing the burden with you. You now hold the creature by its head while running side by side is awkward. The weight isn't overwhelming. Your palfrey leads the two of you up the hill. I didn't even touch you, huh? Some good dodging, ha <laughs> ha, he warmly laughs. But let's not tempt fate. He looks back, yells in panic, and speeds up. Oh! <laughs> I tell him to prepare for a fight. But the clash never comes. After another minute, the beast gives up on its pursuit, though you wouldn't have realized it if it wasn't for Scambled Egg, who now trots without a single care. You look back, and the Saurian indeed backs down, moving to its pond slowly. Once you approach the woods, you take a short break. Even from a distance, you can see a distinct trail leading between the trees. Not a garden, this forest, the man speaks briefly, gasping from the burden. But not too dark, and cats are but few. Boars are there, though, and gargoyles. Better not go too deep. There are no roads there. His face is not much older than twenty, shaved with great care, cleaner even than among the city folk. While his hood and heavy cloak mask his figure, he seems well-fed and healthy. We're halfway there, friend. Creeks is a gorgeous place, you know. You love it. I smile. I'm sure I will. Carrying the ebex takes a while, but the man is incapable of being silent. Every unusual tree seems to be tied to a story from his life, and he makes sure that you notice the first stream you cross on the new solid bridge. One of many creeks, you see. <laughs> He says with untamed amusement. A thin gorge leads you between the mountains. If he had to say anything, he'd be like, Hey, watch out for bandits. I'm always very aware of my surroundings. This place is quite susceptible to bandits. Follow the trail of shouts and laughter. Seven people, about twenty years old each, are gathered at the wooden bridge, leaning against the railing, bathing in the stream, lying on the grass. 
Pieces of clothing made of fur and leather are spread around next to cudgels and throwing clubs. Once the sound of hooves manages to break through the chattering, the curious young eyes, untouched by wartime, turn toward you, and an excited whisper spreads. The shells are proudly displayed, and the confident smiles are both inviting and challenging. How's water? The hunter greets his tribesfolk while stepping on the logs. Gentle and warm, says a man, resting on his friend's shoulder. That's an icy bex. There are paths leading in many directions, but the main road will take you uphill. Oh, they're naked. I guess that's what means shells are proudly displayed. I don't give a hell. I've seen, like, animals explode and die or whatever. Like, who cares? It's just naked people. I'm sure- I'm sure Thistle has seen a lot worse. <laughs> He's not phased by that. Flesh of animals. Because people are animals. It's no different than seeing the fact that a cat doesn't wear clothes. Dogs don't wear clothes. Usually, at least. Not not usually. Person is no different. It's just a bigger, slightly more hairless, vaguely more intelligent creature. There's no reason for me to be embarrassed. I look at them. The light dances on wet hair, both on their heads and crotches, luring your eyes just as much as the revealed chests and muscular arms. That's not true for Thistle. Like I just said, Thistle sees other people as, like, animals. <laughs> Not like a psychopathic way, but like a very neutral scientific way. The same way that like somebody who's a mortician performing an autopsy is not going to be like, ooh, nipples. Like, <laughs> or I don't know, maybe some morticians are, but I feel like if you get used to it enough and you detach the human body from any sort of emotional value, just recognize it as like a neutral object that exists the same way that a cup or a plate would. It's just a pile of flesh. What is a man but a pile of flesh, you know? So he, Thistle, sees it in a very neutral, kind of detached way. He's more- he's not- he's not lured by the reveal of chests and arms. He's just kind of like, yep, those are people, and so what? I feel absolutely nothing about this. They're just people. I've interrupted not just their bath. The soul who's speaking with your guide is embracing another man as he's sitting behind him, while one of the women is keeping her arm around the waist of yet another man. You hardly see any wounds or marks caused by sickness. The harshest days of this group are still ahead. As you move your eyes from one person to another, they greet you with kind nods, but you notice that their eyes are focused on your rugged clothes. Once you step off the bridge, the hunter chuckles. Seeking warm, hmm? Don't worry, we're not that obsessed with outfits. The wolf's head bounces as he speaks. I nod to the group, then follow the man. The palisade is as tall as trees, but being placed on the top of the crags makes it look impassable. What? Why is the gate closed? The hunter turns to the watchtower and repeats his question, only louder. Maybe call Ela? Too blind to see we have a guest, hmm? A hardly visible guard with a female voice leans from the tower. He's coming, Howler, relax. Her shouts hint of no patience towards him. The youth down in the woods after the bath, why wouldn't we close? The man glances at you. He would kind of be quiet in this situation because he is a quiet person, but also I do want to get more information. Who's Ela? I whisper. Oh, just my brother. He gestures for you to ignore it. And I'm Efren, so thanks to our parents, folks keep mistaking our names. But Ela has a stick in his ass and is as boring and nagging as a legless donkey. The soul from the tower hides again and the gate opens. The sparse clumps of grass survive only on the edges of this spacious yard. The few onlookers wear working clothes, suitable for their hard labour. They're carrying tools, planks and logs. You're next to a large building of unusual shape, either a temple or a house of gathering. It makes you think of a cabin that's been getting larger over the course of the years, with a section in the middle being darker and more crude than the outer ones. A slightly overweight man is standing in front of the building with open arms. Welcome to Creeks, friend. His voice and eyes are gentle, but there's vigor in his stance and gestures. Efren was meant to hunt, but I see he brought not one, but two unusual creatures. The hunter rolls his eyes. Don't embarrass us with this prattle. He raises his voice and fills it with bitterness, addressing no soul in particular. Hunt maybe ask someone to help us with this ebex. It's our shared catch. He points at you. Now I want to know to whom we're grateful. Ela nods toward you. While I introduce myself, I observe him more closely. Being close to thirty years old, he's one of the older souls around. Just like the other villagers, he has clothes made of animals, not plants. The leather pants and jacket are humble, but the shoulder cape, reaching from his neck to his elbows, used to belong to a yellow elk. His brown skin is darker than that of a farmer, and as you look at the outreached hands, they carry the marks of being cut by tools. And I'm Ela, the carpenter. 
He takes a step toward the fruit trees and invites you to move forward. Like most men in the village, he's cleanly shaved. How about I show you the rest of the village? It may be humble, but it's as beautiful as a blue starling. Oh, I already had an opportunity to see the Oh my god. What? No, nobody would say that. Oh my god. <laughs> me, me in real life interacting with people. I've wasted enough time. Why is this vulnerable? Be sad, tired, afraid, or hopeless. Can we talk about the peninsula instead? <laughs> He's just gonna be neutral. Thanks, Ina. That sounds lovely. As he grins, you notice his unusually white teeth. He moves with heavy but enthusiastic steps. It won't really take that long, but we have quite a view. I swear, interrupts the hunter, I'm not carrying this ebex to the kitchen. Someone call the cooks! After dropping the carcass on the ground, he springs away, fretting at the blood on his hands. Let's take a stroll then, says Ela as he leads you forward. Your mount can drink at the creek here. Come, scrambled egg. You tether your mount to a tree next to drying laundry. Ela points at the land behind the bridge proudly. Our newest addition to the village. The hunters grow old, so we're taking steps away from meat and fruits. You spot only two people working in the field, or rather a large garden covered with cabbages, carrots, onions, and garlic, indistinguishable from the wild plants growing in the woods. On the path between the two halves of the field, an elderly woman is sitting on a stool, looking in your direction as if you're interrupting her contemplation. Old Hava there will turn this place into a proper farm one day. She has little strength, but keeps precious memories of her trade. You lack proper seeds. Uh, the good ones are expensive, Eel responds right away, if it's part of a prepared speech. And we weren't sure about our soil. It's all just a test. He invites you with a gesture to follow him deeper into the village. And there are no seeds in Gale Rocks, while the folks at Howlers won't spare their own. They'd rather force us to buy food from them. There are farmers in White Marshes, adds Ephraim, but it's a dark place. Who knows what we'd reap after a year. It's rough. <laughs> That's rough, buddy. The bonfire spot is surrounded by logs that were cut into tables and stools. Ela approaches the nearest chair, rubbing its back with his cut hands. When we share a meal, we do so here, sometimes beneath the stars. You'd have to see it. The flames dance on the walls to the monster roars and crickets. Efren's voice also grows in enthusiasm. Dining at the edge of the forest is something you wouldn't forget. Unless you can drink, don't swallow anything stronger than spoiled Hebex milk. The shadows, friend. Terrifying. You glance over the wooden buildings. While the walls seem fine, the roofs are primitive, mostly made of planks that are already soggy and bent. There are a few people working on cleaning bark from a log, but the square is mostly quiet, with a few kids observing you from above their toys. I think this is what he would want to say, but he would recognize that that might kind of kill their vibe. He wouldn't want these new people he's just met to kind of turn on him. He, he's in his artificial charm mode at the moment, as he always is when he's meeting new individuals for the first time. So he's also not going to say this and go too sappy. I think this is kind of neutral. He's still kind of making a critical comment, but it's not like blatantly critical. Running such fires must take a lot of wood. It's not something we need to worry about. Ela shows you to look around. We mostly burn what's left after soaring in construction, gathering fuel for a few dozen days. Some of us think they can learn woodworking all by themselves, Efren says mockingly. So we waste a lot of wood. At least we can roast meat on long sticks as we sit here. Well, we already have results. The carpenter moves his hand from the chair to his stomach. Everything you see here, friend, was built by us and our elders. How about I show you our old forest? Is it far away? You find the answer right away. You stand between two of the houses in front of the gate of an animal pen. The walls are made of sharpened trunks and are as tall as two humans. The captured beasts are tethered by ropes, but have enough freedom to wander and graze. Two brown boars and a black mouflon. And here are our captives, Efren declares proudly. I know, it's still a bit empty, but we'll crowd it just before winter. Are the ropes really enough to keep them here? Can't they chew through them? Both men look at the animals with a renewed curiosity. Well, the hunter starts, if they can free themselves from a hemp rope, then squeeze through the stakes all while no soul sees them, and then get to freedom again, I'd say they deserve to do so. Ela leans against the gate and points at the area behind the palisade. The mouflon may disappear, but the paws will be stuck on this plateau. Have you noticed the old forest, friend? I look north. The vast clearing is returning to life, with shrubs spread between the paths and tree stumps. You move to the bridge and the gateway and have a chance to look around. We can see the edge of our world from the watchtower. 
Ella narrates sublimely. In the long distance, the plateau ends, surrounded by cliffs. You either climb up the mountains or fall to your death. Both men tell you about the difficult past of the village. A desperate camp, then a cabin, then two, shifting its wooden walls as more and more trees were cut. Without tree crowns, we could walk with no shadows, bee stems, gargoyle eyes, concludes the carpenter. I mean, I kind of do want to say this, but... I don't know, I, I, it doesn't, it's not my business if these people want to die out here doing whatever they're doing. So, you know, maybe I should just kind of play along with their little thing and not be too critical. Is it really better than a forest garden? It would produce much more food. Now I see only berries. You hit the heart of our worries, friend. Hila admits and is interrupted by the hunter quickly. We do what we had to do to push away the beasts. They don't feel safe here and don't seek food on the shrubs as they would on trees. Hila tells you there's one more thing to see, and as you walk away, he returns to the matter at hand. The animals keep their distance now, at least in the meadows, so hunting for them gets difficult. And meat with hardly any mushrooms and herbs gets bland. A forest garden would solve the problem, sure, but we don't know enough to even start one. Hence, a field of berries. He taps his stomach. First, we need to learn how to feed our children. We lack strength and skill, Ephra looks at you. But we have time. I nod. With time comes opportunity. You reach the edge of the village, a cliff as tall as the wall. Beneath you, two creeks meet each other and form a gentle river. These are the trees we use to learn more about woodwork. Either is smiling as he leans his back against the wall of a house. We plant new ones, but we'll soon have to bring wood from further away. Give the saplings a few years, or however long they grow. A decade? And this is where I leave the two of you with your boring tree talks. Efren points at you. See me later if you need. I'll be around. I rarely hunt alone. The carpenter watches his departing companion with genial eyes. Well, there's work to be done. A new chair awaits me. He leads you to a humble working station placed at the edge of the square. The tools you notice are very simple, if not primitive. We don't have to talk about my trade, Thistle. What brings you to us? Um, so many things, girl. You would not imagine. <laughs> well, here's the new song. I think it's a new one. Is a stereo around? What if he's just there? He's been chilling out in a nudist colony. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's what happened to him. He just said, I am tired of being a road warden. I'm gonna go be naked. Uh, I, is, is there any particular order I really need to say these things in? Old Pagos is suffering from a plague. The village is isolating itself from outsiders. He freezes, puts away his tools, and looks at you with wide eyes. Oh, wait for a bit, will you? Without waiting for your response, he springs up and knocks down a few planks as he lurches away, asking his neighbors to call the entire tribe. Ooh, the tea, this is big news apparently. People surround you, asking what's going on. Once the news spreads, you answer dozens of questions, though most of what you say could be summed up with, I'm not sure. Aside from the worried faces, there are also more pragmatic ones. Hunters mention they won't be able to deliver their autumn pelts, while one of the farmers wonders about her cousin. She was always so pious, he says with an accent you remember from old Pagos. <laughs> I'm not giving them accurate accents. I'm just, I'm reading off the top of my head. You don't prepare, I don't practice. Uh, pre I'm basically just sight reading everything. Maybe I will read a line one more time if I cough in the middle of it, but <laughs> I'm not paying enough attention to have intricately planned accents. Sorry. May the right reward her prayers, or else. After some time, the crowd pays you little attention, and Ila leads you back to his workshop. They and I will discuss this later, he says with an absent voice, and sits down and glances at his neighbors. I've heard about the bandits. Have they caused you any troubles? He makes an awkward cut with a chisel and lets out a quiet shit, then starts to rub the plank with his thumb. Bandits, you say? Uh, soldiers from the city have already taken care of them. <laughs> he pretends there are no bandits in the north. I need to gain his trust. Is Asterion around? He halts his work and looks at you with an exaggerated frown. Well, that's a weird question. You're the first road warden I've seen in, well, this season, I think. Did you check the western villages? You'll get to Howlersdale simply by staying on the road. His right hand, still holding a tool, is now squeezing his stomach gently. People say that Astarion has spent a lot of time in your village. I think you're hiding something. He adjusts his shoulder cape and clears his throat with a grunt. <clears throat> People, huh? Well, there's some truth to that, but Asterion isn't here and we don't know where he is. We took our coins, but for fair labour. 
He moved wares to other settlements, patrolled the roads, escorted an old woman to a druid and back. Did you know you can get good prices for iron at Howersdale? Even better at White Marshes. Seeing your luck, he turns away and rests his elbow on his workbench. His plans are his own problem, and I've no reason to believe he wanted to be found, nor can I help you. His village isn't much older than you are. What's its story? He proudly raises a carving knife and gestures for you to look around. It may be a young village, but there's a lot to say. While his story is bloated with names, relationships, a step-by-step -step description of the growth of the settlement and bothersome creatures, you get the gist of it. The settlers arrived here 25 years ago, soon after one of the Tin Cities had fallen to the southern invasion. Most of them came from the capital, while some joined them along the way. They soon came to realize that none of the villagers had enough space or the will to host a dozen refugees. The folks of Gale Rocks used to have a much kinder attitude towards strangers than they do now, and they offered the newcomers to stay at the beach behind their village. Yet there was nothing for them to eat other than what they caught in the salt waters. They soon started their search for a land remote enough to not compete with the locals, and with the help of kind folks from Gale Rocks, White Marshes, Old Pagos, and others, as Ela vaguely states, they received enough wood and tools to turn a scrap of this plateau into a clearing, then a camp, a hamlet, and finally a village. Is this sarcastic? Because I would genuinely be like, fascinating stuff, like, you know, I, I think Thistle would love history. This would like, he's an academic. So it actually is fascinating to him. I'm going to save just in case. I can't tell if it's meant to be sarcastic or not. Fascinating stuff. Hale is assisted by walking around the village, introducing you to the original settlers or their offspring, and showing you some of the treasures displayed in the House of Gatherings. A unicorn's horn found at the heart of the woods. A blue rock that's shaped and hollow like an egg and is darker inside. An arrow that hit a fright ape in the eye and knocked it down. Behind each of them, there are names, stories, and memories. At the very end, Ela leads you back to his workbench, holding a hand on his conspicuous stomach. Give his throat some rest, he turns the topic around. And what are the folks in Hovlevan like, friend? Froggy says there are thousands of souls at the capital, and one can go their entire life still finding new faces in the crowd. Ooh, is this another option where I get to decide the lore of my own city? Because I, I don't know, if there's some place I have supposedly read about Hoblevon or something before, I haven't read about it, I don't know. When I answer things like this, I'm just- guess you kind of get to make your own lore. Basically, people are too busy, nobody knows what happens behind closed doors, hard to get to know people, it's not easy to build strong friendships, there's distrust everywhere. Wow, that place sounds like it sucks. I mean, this is probably true, he's kind of a cynical person, he might be more inclined to say this, but I think he'd say this. These two things can coexist, you know. You can have uh, rich upper classes and corrupt priests and merchants and whatever, but also the common folk can be very friendly and sociable and communal amongst each other. So I think like both of these things are true, but instead of focusing on this more negative part, he's gonna emphasize, you know, well, let's leave the stuff about the corrupt politicians out and just be like, well, the common folk are very friendly, actually. One can easily find groups to hang out with. People shop together, work, take baths, pray, and when one has nothing to do in the evening, they just go outside and seek company. It's not easy to build a strong friendship, though. Other than that last part, it sounds similar to our way of living. Folks stay inside only to sleep or shag, and even that's not a rule. He adjusts his shoulder cloak and smiles. But we also form bonds. One big family and all. I've heard you have some issues with the Eastern Path. At first he gives you a bright smile, but then nods with a sigh. Yes, yes, so our issues are so clear that folks gossip on them. I'm glad you came to our help, friend, but it doesn't feel right to admit we need help from an outsider. He stands up slowly, walks away, and leaps over one of the log-made tables, looking for something in the pile of wood. In this part of the land, there's always going to be something to do for a road warden. He straightens up with a piece of charred wood in his hand and gets back to you. As he draws black lines on the workbench, he mentions a few names. Creeks, Foggies, Gale Rocks there, here's the lake. The map is simplistic and doesn't align with your own understanding of local distances, but you follow his description without issues. The path from here to the south is getting too wild for us, he repines, making another few strokes. The merchants travel through the other route, through Howler's Dell, passing by old Pagos and White Marshes. Once they reach Foggy, they already have full stomachs and many deals closed, and when they travel back, they visit the same places again. Folks already know that trading here takes a long time. So, you want me to give them an option to get to you first, and move west without backtracking, and do so all by myself. 
How exactly? Well, I'm sure you can find some help. He pats his stomach without noticing that he leaves a few black dots on his leather jacket. Does the character described as overweight have to touch his stomach every five seconds? I get that maybe it's like a not a nervous tick. You know, some people fidget in certain ways. Like, maybe that's just how he fidgets, but it seems a little bit erm. <laughs> Unless maybe there's something wrong, you know, if later we find out he has stomach cancer or IBS or something and he's he gets a stomach injury or something, maybe that's why he's touching it all the time. But it's probably not intentional. It can just come across as a little bit like subtly making fun of fat people or pointing out, pointing out their bodies more than any other character. There's a few things you could do. Follow the eastern road and see if it's clear. Are there any safe shelters left? Any blockades to get rid of? Is there an overgrown path to burn? And maybe see if the road here to the western crossroads is safe, or if the cars could get through the heart of the woods if you're brave enough. Uh, I hope you're a soul with sage judgement. Seeing your puzzled look, he rests his palms on the table with a shy smile. I know I'm vague, but I bet you already know more about these roads than I do, friend. His eyes return to the map, and after a moment of hesitation, he rubs an uneven line at his thumb. I mean, this is kind of a good idea. Maybe it could get get the people working together. I know apparently places don't get along, but maybe this could foster something. Wouldn't it be better for you to put the work into the western road? You could split the labor with the other settlements. Oh, they can't be trusted, especially some of them. He crosses the western side of his map with a long, thin line. Even a paved route would force merchants to add another day of pointless travel to their plans, and that's a big loss in their trade. Having our path clear gives everyone more options and more convenience. How can you know if I'll be honest with you? I... He looks at you in silence, then clinches his stomach. Can't most likely but the more news you bring us the farther away from the village our foragers and hunters will be willing to roam foggy's boys as well i expect sooner or later the truth will surface and i'll advise my tribe to take a lesson from whatever we're bound to find you forgot to mention my pay well it depends on what you're about to do the tribe has but few dragons to confirm his words he enters the nearby house from which he picks up an old wooden case crude in shape and with an unsightly engraving of a three-headed hydra on its lid Inside it, you see maybe two dozen dragon bones. Let's say you'll get a dragon for any news about cleared or blocked areas, and more if it takes real effort from you. I feel like he would kind of want to say this. This all is sort of all about getting rich and everything, but at the same time, he's currently trying to build trust with these people. And also, half the time, he makes no money for anything anyway. <laughs> so it's like, kind of like, take the scraps where I can get it sort of thing. Where would you like me to start? Go to the shelters just at the side of the roads. There's a ruined campsite west of Foggy's. He makes a small circle on his map. Or you could go south to a cabin our elders built. He makes a larger square. It's halfway from here to the river. Take a look around and see what's their condition. If there are any beasts around, you can handle a few small creatures, can't you? So, two shelters and then you just want me to take care of anything I find? He laughs, but not with his eyes. Forgive me, friend, but you don't sound like someone with much experience behind them. You're nothing like a Syrian. He took pride in his self-reliance. Alright, well, why don't you fucking- Who are you to talk about experience? You don't even know how to run a fucking village, Mr. Man, Mr. Boy, Mr. Baby Boy. I'm just trying to be clear on my objectives. If somebody asks me to do something, I want details about what I'm supposed to do. I'm not just gonna be like, alright, yep, I'll just go do whatever. I don't like to be presumptive. I don't like to make assumptions. That's not being unself-reliant. That's just wanting to have a clear goal before you set out on the go but fine 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 excuse me for trying to learn more about the situation i guess i should act first and think later like mr big Asterion. well he's gone isn't he <laughs> look where that got him <laughs> we have a deal he's tired could you tell the tiredness in his voice flashes you a wide smile and pats his stomach oh you won't regret this he then throws away the charred wood returns to his stool and looks for his tools so there's f oh is that that place that i went where there was the foxes i do want to look inside there yeah oh i can tell him a few things i took a look at the dolmen in the south it's safe keep sculpting wood and asks you about the size and the entrance of the chapel i've heard it's small but not that small not enough for a group but maybe a lone traveler without a mount he looks at you with a smile pick a dragon bone from the case will you i don't want to stop now I reach toward the ugly head of a hydra i grab a coin well, that's a start. Keep it up. I encountered a fallen tree in the far south. You describe its exact location. 
I guess it was unavoidable for this to happen at one point or another. Too bad it's so far away from here. He stops his work and turns toward you. So, would you like to help us with that, friend? You ask him what he proposes, and he describes what he calls a day of honest work. Just come to me some day in the early hours. I still need to discuss this with the tribe, but I'll ask the stronger folks to travel with you to the tree. They'll agree if they feel like the roads can be trusted. Split it into blocks, get it on wagons, bring it here. It won't go to waste, and the road will be cleared. When you mention it's going to take an entire day, he agrees. And you'll get five dragon bones for it. Just come to me when you're healthy, and only if you already know what's on the route from that point. You'll put a lot of trust into your guidance and protection, Thistle. I mean, I kind of do want to say this, but again, he's he's trying to be as charming and nice to them as possible at the moment while he feels out the situation. He doesn't want to get on anybody's bad side until he sees what he could get from them. <laughs> Which at this point doesn't seem like much, but at least he's getting a few dragon bones, you know. So, you want me to get to know the entire route, make sure it's safe enough for your tribe to follow it, and come here in the morning, but only if I can handle the journey. Quite a list, but fine, we'll see. He thinks about your words, then reaches for his case. You're right, that's a lot. I can't help you much, but at least you deserve one bone right away for bringing me the message. Uh, maybe buy some rations for it, or a good rest. Actually, we also need at least one day to prepare ourselves. Thanks. Well, that's a start. Keep it up. I'll let you know if there's anything else. Blows at the shavings, sending them flying to settle on the ground, and considers the next tool to select. I'm not going to tell him this because I don't think he's going to listen. Or maybe he will. If the option shows up, does that mean he trusts me? Uh, does that mean he trusts me? Is he confused? I'll ask him a few more things. This is, is this kind of weird? What do you think about your, like, your brother? What's he going to say? Oh, that slimy bitch. <laughs> I imagine being a carpenter in this part of the realm isn't easy. You have a healthy imagination. He rests his elbow on the workbench and smiles. I have patience, and I'm getting better with tools, and these are some shoddy tools, he says singingly. It's hard to disagree with him. They've been used for many years, with only the wooden parts being somewhat in shape since they seem to have been recently replaced. The steel chisels and saws are jagged and dull. The hammers and axes are made of stone. Some of them were brought here by the settlers, and we can't buy any more right now. There's work to be done, but I do have a plan. You ask him to explain, and he's all too eager to do so. He enters the nearby house and shows you his more successful works, each of which has some shortcomings, noticeable even to a layperson. A bowl engraved with fish was poorly planned, with animals too large to fit the entire space, so part of it is blank. A simple relief of two naked people in their embrace looks almost believable, but the legs are in one case too long and in the other too short. One chair has a broken leg, and the remaining three show that they are a bit too ambitiously shaped and got dangerously thin. The chest seems fine, but the equipment sticks out of it. The man acknowledges that he wrongly estimated the required size. So you want to be an artist? Better. I want to turn pots, cups, weapons, cupboards, everyday stuff into things of beauty. Seeing your look, he pats his stomach. I know I'm far from mastering it, but trust me, these are so much better than the ones I did this winter, and I started only three years ago. His pride makes him look even lo- Oh my god, why you stop talking about fucking big- <laughs> The big fat stomach man touched his fat fucking stomach to show how big and large he is. His voice showed how fat he is. <laughs> not many carpenters in the peninsula. Folks do things for their own use, but I will be a specialist. It's the city thing. Foggy told me so. Not just a jointer, but someone who does only a few things but better than others. The tribe supports me with food and time, and I will pay them back with dragon bones. And prettier houses. When he leads you outside, you start to share some of his excitement, but most of it dwindles away after you sit down at his workbench again, on wobbly stools surrounded by broken planks and crude tools. What do you think about Ephraim? Gives you a surprised look. I care for him deeply. He's brave and has a big heart, but his soul is clouded. He thinks we have no right to waste what the dead have sacrificed for our sake, and that we disrespect them by staying weak. But all of it is just a cloak that hides him. He cares not about respect, but about his guilt. It takes a bit of convincing before he explains what he means by that. Our father died from claws, our mother from a bad birth. We used to have five brothers and sisters, all of them dead now. Some maybe could have been saved, but not all, and surely not by being stronger. Yet Ephraim keeps thinking he had every opportunity to fix the tragedies, and he's to blame for letting them down. Him and I both. He falls silent. But at least I put my shame to use. 
He reaches for his tools again. We already have everything we need. A beautiful home, enough food, fewer beasts than ever. It's going to be a rough lifetime for us. He takes a swing. But our kids will be fine. I'd like to learn more about the peninsula. Our tribe won't be of much help there, he admits while judging the harsh surface of a small plague. It was our parents who did all the travelling. They did so while we were kids, or not yet born. Most of them are already gone, and most of us travel no further than to Foggy's, and only when we have to. Should I bring this up again, or is he going to say he still doesn't trust me? I'm worried about those bandits, Eula. He looks at you for a bit, then nods slowly. Those are not some strangers, but folks of the north, our neighbours. One of them is from our very own tribe. And they don't target us, just strangers. You ask him again if he's sure no one from his village has been targeted so far. And after a cold yes, he reaches for a carving knife. I will see you later. Gambled egg is pouring at the ground and welcomes your arrival with a snort. Erm, jeez. I have a lot of dialogue news I could go through. What time is it? It's 7 hours 50 minutes. It's, is this still the same day that it was? Like, there's so much dialogue to these parts. I think I haven't actually slept <laughs> in the past long time. Oh, shite. Is there shelter here? I have to go sleep with Foggies again. Maybe there are some locals looking for a match in other villages. After a few minutes, you find yourself sitting at a table with Shoshi, a dark-haired 20-year-old who some call a woodcutter, others a singer. In both of these roles, her massive stature must be of help. When she walks, she either carries a large axe on her shoulders or swings it around, towering over her tribesfolk like a chieftain from the tales of war. She admits she enjoys a friendly shag from time to time, but can't see a future for her in creeks. Half of these friends lose their lives in the wilderness. I start seeing cats and gargoyles in every shadow. I'd rather have a few calm, safe years at the side of a pretty little woman who I'll see in my bed in the evenings. Though you know, friend, not just her. <laughs> she lets out sonorous laughter. You mention that you don't know if she'll be able to keep her trade after moving away, and she strokes her axe with affection. Oh, I'd miss these woods, but who knows? My tribe can't be the only one that cuts trees around here. You try to ask her about her worldview, but she gets bored by the topic. We here, she looks around, have no temples and priests, and I don't aim to become one. Farewell. Gambled Egg is lazily looking around as it rests on the dusty path. Let's talk to Ephraim and see what he's got to say. He raises an eyebrow, then the wolf's head as if to see you better. Are you the only hunter around? But of course not! There's... Uh, he takes a suspiciously long pause. Seven of us! The tribe is small! We have enough food without daily trips. If we catch too much meat, it's spoiled, so it's better to let the animals feel safe. You try to change the topic, but the man suddenly looks around and lowers his wolf's head. Well, there's just one issue. Three of my friends left the village just a few days ago, and they haven't returned yet. But they should. Ela is growing worried. Why do you think... Why do you think these other... Why do you think... Will you stop every single time that I try and say something my weird phone makes a goat noise? What is going on? Why do you think these other hunters aren't back yet? He walks around from time to time looking at you with an open mouth, not sure how to start. He takes off his heavy cloak and looks you in the eyes. They left for a few days to seek and kill some big game, each of them a different one, then bring all of them for me to judge. His confident voice falters when he mentions his own part. Uh, the winner would have caught me the prey of the greatest size, rarity, utility, and of the greatest threat. He turns away and lowers the wolf's mouth. As your tribe often send lone hunters. Why not work in groups? Uh, this isn't a hunt, but a competition. The winner names their first child. Oh, I've heard their arguments. You wouldn't believe how hard it is to pick a name when you have three parents. He chuckles to himself. Once the memory fades, he gets serious again. But I can't disagree with you, friend. It's the first time in many years since my tribesfolk have gone on such a reckless trip, and I fear it may remind us why the peninsula isn't a place for adventures. Tell me more about those three. They are hunters and fighters, but also close friends. If one of them was in trouble, the others would have done all they could to help. They've been a team for years, and we're planning to start a family this winter, you know. Their last big adventure before Dahlia's belly locks her at home. He gives you quite a tale of their deeds and features. Dahlia is the bravest of them, with strong legs. She has simple ways and looks for the beasts in the open by the roads. Her hair is light, always tied in a single braid. Adamant is a man who seeks paths and challenges. He believes that seeking knowledge of the peninsula will bring the tribe ways to survive hardships. He was, is, smaller than the others, and knows more about dressing the wild game than any of us. His arms are small, so he often places traps. 
His hair is a bit darker than Dahlia's, but short, just like his beard. Vashel is not a man, though they were born with a prick, and wears browns and greens to blend in with the trees. They hunt like a gargoyle, hiding among leaves, jumping at the creature when it gets close. Because of that, they've often roamed in the woods, even those that are far away from the village. Once again, good to see some different gender representation fantasy stories. They are often too boring fantasy stories. <laughs> I mean, is this fantasy? Yeah, kind of. There's magic. It's like not like um, elfy fantasy, but it's it's like a, a a form of fantasy. Let's say I were to find them. What should I tell them? Have you no shred of optimism? Maybe they're fine. Just tell them to come home. We've got enough wood and food to start the next feast. And I have a hint that an honorable guest may be welcome there. He smiles at you, and for a moment you think you see the wolf's head wink. And where should I start? He looks at you as if you're slow. I... Would have found them myself if I knew. Let the horse take you to the other settlements and ask there. Well, I'm just asking because you want to I hate when people act like you're stupid for asking a question. I'm just trying to get more details. Maybe you could tell me, you know, oh, they were last seen around here or something like that. Come on, man. This sounds serious, but if you want me to look for them, I still deserve a reward. Isn't helping three young, strong souls enough? Seeing your look, he raises his voice, draws his obsidian-edged club, and touches his chest with it. Then I will loyally assist you, friend. For your brave deeds, you may count on me on a day of great challenge. He lowers his weapon. He winks at you. And others will be grateful as well. You know that. I'll tell you if I find anything. Thanks, friend. And if all you have is a tale of their dead shells, bring me something to prove it, yes? A trinket, a weapon, a thing we can throw into the pyre. I found a right and didn't realize I found a raw hide. Does this raw hide belong to your tribe? He gives it only a glance, then throws it away. I think so? After you describe where you found it, he reaches toward the wolf's head, but doesn't touch it. Me and the other hunters go this place in spring when there's fewer beasts around, sit on blankets. He points at the hide. Eat before the hunt. Maybe you'll find a trail there. I'll tell you if I find anything. What do you think about Ela? He repeats your question, making sure he heard correctly. What do I think about Ela? I respect him. He took good care of me as an older brother. Our tale isn't an easy one, so I'd rather keep it to ourselves before you blurt something back to him. Alright, fine. I was just asking. Oh my god. <laughs> do the hunters from Pelt of the North hinder your job? No, they only get closer when they chase after wounded prey, so our woods stay mostly the same. You could have another village twice our size, he glances towards the gate. Halfway from here to Pelt, and there would still be more than enough game for every belly, as long as they would forage and set up farms. You ask him if he's ever considered joining professional hunters, but he takes off the wolf's head and gives it to you so you can take a better look. It's weirdly warm from the sun. That's the only wolf any of us felled in the past five years, you see. Not that we're cowards, he suddenly raises his voice. Our trade just isn't like the big game hunters. I place fish traps. I put glue to catch birds, shoot rocks at rats and rabbits. When in a group, we may seek roe deer or oryx. He takes the hat back and looks at it with nostalgia. Those in the inn seek trophies, not meat, so they hunt for big beasts, ones that, you know, fight back. Our ways are different, but I like that bunch. At least they smile, unlike others in the peninsula. Hunters will always find a common tongue. But once you see enough blood and guts, you have to laugh or go crazy. What do you know about the road running through the heart of the forest? I know to avoid it. Blood there. Seeing that you're waiting for a longer tale, he adjusts his heavy cloak, spending a good minute making sure that you'll understand it's a dangerous place. You'll do better riding around it. The northern road is the safest, he concludes. After you insist that any sort of guidance may be of use, he scratches the wolf's head. I've heard from a friend that gnolls were moving there. Those very small beast folks, you know. He moves an open hand close to his hips, portraying the height. They'll threaten you until you give them some meat, and that's all they eat. No fruits, no, I don't know, uh, bones. But it's the fright apes that scare me the most, and there's an entire family of them. Trust me, if you ever hear the terrible scream of a human somewhere in the tree crowns, run as fast as you can. Don't seek it and certainly don't fight it, just ride as fast as you can. I plan to help the foragers with catching a big runner. Any tips on how to approach this? So that's their scheme. He looks in the tavern's direction, pausing for a moment and straightens up. Ah, oh, so you're seeking advice from a more experienced hunter. He pats his club proudly. 
Well, there's the usual stuff. Don't fight hungry, have a decent jacket, be sure to have something to block a bird's charge. Oh, and maybe, he points at the sky, then stretches out his arms as if holding a long stick. A spear! The longer you keep a runner at distance, the better. Have you ever fought such a bird? Not yet, but I ran away from a few, and not everyone can say that. <laughs> he lets out a burst of jaunty laughter. They are way too common at the edges of our woods, if you ask me. Ever since I met the first one, I jog. Maybe not every day, but almost. Oh, can I do it? Does he trust me now, or what? I think I'm gonna wait. I'll wait and come back and ask him later. I walk away, have a good hunting. Gambled Egg is observing the monkeys moving on the surface of the rock face, swinging its tail. Let's talk to Old Hava. Follow the path between the fields, witnessing a one-sided conversation between Old Hava and a barely adult man. She orders him around, pointing at various plants, criticizing the sight of weeds and addressing the fancy clothes he's wearing. He observes his red-dyed boots and lets out a relieved sigh after your arrival. I better change, he mumbles, heading to the main square. Step out of his way. The woman spares you a wry glance, then turns away, focused on the struggling vegetables. She's the only person in the village who wears clothes made of plant fabric, but they're weathered and covered with decades-old patches. Her hands, clasped behind her back, are constantly twitching. You thought huh? Back in my day! What do you have for sale? Seems a little no-nonsense, seems a little matter-of-fact to the point. It might be good to just be like, Hey, what do you have for sale? You know, instead of trying to be nice or anything. Or maybe just wait. Just be quiet. Don't bother her by talking. But then I feel like if I just sit there, she could be like, What are you standing around for, idiot? <laughs> I wait patiently. After a minute, you realize that her keen eyes are indeed observing the leaves instead of just disregarding your presence. She clears her throat and points at one of the carrots. Their color is good. Dark. But they're small. I think the soil is too dense. She's gathering her thoughts for another few breaths, then looks at you softly. I have time now, Road Warden. I'm looking for a place to sleep. We need another hut, and we have no space for it. She gazes at you with dry, tired eyes. If you need a scrap of floor, go to the tavern. What do you have for sale? We sold what we had. We're lacking hunters. And these, she looks at the wrinkled vegetables, will go into a stew if they're even worth picking. Without noticing it, she grabs her left forearm with her right hand, but it doesn't stop the twitching. We always have a fish trap to spare. We make them just in case. A large basket. Put it in a creek and wait a day or two until something swims inside. I'd sell you one for two dragon bones. And if you'd rather eat something right away, she carries on after a short pause, our cooks would spare you a roast grouse or chicken. It'll be cold but fresh. We always have one. You never know when there are maggots in your supplies, and kids shouldn't skip a meal. You ask her to tell you more, but her patience grows thin. It's the best light roast in the north. We add plenty of spices to it so it spoils slowly. That's it. Fine. Show me how this trap works. Oh, a roast chicken! She cracks her knuckle. I can ask her for earplugs? I met some annoying howlers. Do you have any earplugs? Her shoulders flinch. But will that work? They can break the skull of a death shell. After you shrug, she looks at one of the farmers who's wearing mouflon fur. Give me something good to eat, and I'll give you a few tufts of thick wool. Put them into your ears, then wear them under a tight hood. I have a food ration to spare, and we always need more of them. She orders the farmer to bring her a knife. After a few minutes, you hold a new pair of earplugs. I don't expect many merchants to reach this place. Why don't you move your traps to Foggy's? What is it to you? She doesn't wait for your response. Does her yard look like it has space for nets? Okay. I was just making a suggestion. Scambled eggs napping in the shadow of a tree. Yep, should I? Okay, I'm almost done in this town, and then I'm gonna be done because I've been recording for like two hours, and all I did was read stuff. I, <laughs> I think, what, I had nine hours of the day left? Now I have six hours left. I've barely passed any time. It's just a lot of reading, which is fun. I love, I love games that are mostly reading, but still... <laughs> I feel like I'm not making any progress, I'm just gathering information. But guess what? Information is progress. And so there. <laughs> I approach the shallow creek. With the calming sounds of the waterfall around you, you observe the stream as clean as a spring. The oak ash soap you own is not enough to help you get cleaner. You need at least two pieces of bathing equipment to get more out of this place. Well, bollocks. Can I jump into the stream? Why am I doing that? Just for fun? 
So it said I'm not gonna get clean, so what is the point? Just wanna see what happens. I jump into the stream. There are no fish or plants to bother with, and your feet find mud among the not always smooth pebbles. The water reaches above your waist, allowing you to have some fun, wash every spot of your shell. Thanks to the gentle flow, you're able to remove the mud stains from your clothes and boots. Oh, it did help me a little bit. Nice. Alright, I'm going to be done here because it's been two hours that I've been recording. I guess, um... So here's- oh, I can't even go anywhere from here, I have to go back. But I found creeks. What I'm looking for is Gale Rocks? Gale Rocks is a place that guy with a fish is. Also, in two days, I need to be back at the foggy place, so I- I think- it doesn't seem like I made a lot of progress, but I did kind of make progress because I find a new place and get new information from new people and got some new quests and blah blah blah, so I think- I think that's good, I guess, next time go back and then maybe go this way, try and connect these two. To complete this circle first, and once I complete the circle, I can start branching out, like going here and, and tracing back over my steps, going to some of these places that I kind of never finished going to or whatever. And go through here one more time, see if I can complete this path. Okay, thank you for watching. I will hopefully not take eight months to record before the next one, as long as uh, nothing happens, my computer doesn't explode or etc. Goodbye.